Hi, everybody. My name is Yaa Jamaluddin. I'm the coordinator of Advanced Force Studio, the architecture program. I would like to welcome both the urban design and the Advanced Force architecture students, uh, as well as you know, other GSAP students and faculty who've decided to join our lecture this afternoon. The lecture, uh, the title of the lecture is Designing for Resilience. It will be delivered by Adriana Chavez and Rico, uh, uh, so, so, sorry, Victor Rico, uh, who is actually joining us from his office, from their office in Mexico City, if I'm not mistaken. Adriana is a faculty at the Urban Design Program here at the school, together with her partners, Victor Rico and Elena Tudela. She has co-founded ORU, Office for Urban Resilience, in 2014, a design think tank that focuses on implementing innovative solutions for cities through urban design and landscape infrastructure with a water sensitive approach. Among many exciting projects, the work include the contribution to build the urban resilience agenda in the city of Mexico in collaboration with CDMX, Public Space Authority. Adriana holds a master's degree in urbanism, landscape and ecology and a master in architecture from GST, where she graduated from in 2014. Victorico also graduated from GST in 2014 with a master in urban design. Together, they bring more than 10 years of experience working with public, private, and academic institutions and NGOs. So on behalf of all of us, I would like to welcome Adriana and Victor. Um, guys, the, I think the floor is yours at this point and you can unmute. Hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to be able to be here and that this lecture can be delivered. Uh, we are also exploring this new format of Zoom, so we hope that even if we are located in a virtual environment, maybe we can have some interaction. So I was going to ask everybody to shake their hands, but everybody has a camera off, so my strategy is not possible, but we just wanted to, to say hi at the beginning. And to start the lecture, I'm also going to share my screen. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to, this is, I'm looking now, some of you shaking hands. Yeah, uh, okay, that was the objective. <laughs> Hi, hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to see you all. Uh, I'm gonna share uh, Victor, the award to Victor so that he can present himself as well. Okay, um, all right, I think I'm muted now. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. And I think we've been properly introduced. So I think we can start with the presentation that we have prepared for all of you. Thanks for joining. Oh. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. But we can we cannot hear Victor. Ah, we yeah. cannot hear Victor. Do you I hear Victor? We can. Uh, no. no, you can. Okay. Everybody is on. on the line. <laughs> We're good. We're good to go. Okay, excellent. Thank Very you so much. Good. Okay. So this is Oru. We have this is big well, we have co-founded Oru between Victor, Elena Tudela, who can't join us today, and myself, Adriana. Our practice is based in Mexico City. We are a firm that specializes in urban resilience uh, through urban design and landscape infrastructure projects. The three of us met when we were studying at the Harvard GSD back in 2013. While we were studying, we put together the application for Mexico cities for to be part of the 100 Resilient Initiative from the Rockefeller Foundation. And that was our first, we can say that it was our first official collaboration, which was very successful because the, the city was selected. And thereafter, since, since that time, 
since 2014 to, 2000, to 2018, we have acquired experience in the academic, public, private, and development back se sectors. We can see the image on the left. It's the resilient strategy for Mexico City, in which I participated. And on the right, we can see some projects in which Victor and Elena have also participated, such as the Towards a Water Sensitive Mexico City, which is a water, strate water management strategy through public space developed with the government of Mexico City with the Public Space Authority, which is an entity that developed uh, public space projects within the government. So it was basically having an urban design studio within the city government, which was a very exciting moment for the city. Right. So unfortunately, that disappeared. Um, and then we had the Quebradora Park, which is another project in which Elena participated, and that also uh, won a gold medal Holcim Award last year. So within the three of us, we got a different experience, but we established our practice in 2018. And now we have other five red members that are joining us. I think they, they joined this link, uh, Carolina, Nestor, Bernal, and Ivan, and Laureline. So we are a very a small team, but we are going to show the first a little introduction of what we think and how we are working. And then we're going to present you four projects that we think might be relevant to start a conversation with you. So resilience has become our mantra. Resilience is a mindset, it's a lens, a framework that cuts across scales, ecosystems, sociopolitical and economic contexts. In other words, for us to be resilient is to be able to adapt in a world that desperately needs to change. Resilience has allowed us to find new domains for design investment, finding utility to serve the world. As we can see, the world is not on track. We are facing enormous pressures and challenges. Previously, very recently, we have seen the loss of biodiversity in Australia re regarding the wildfires, heat waves in India, wildfires in the Amazon, floods in Jakarta, and even right now the crisis that we are going through. Therefore, our practice questions the role of designers in light of the most pressing issues of the 21st century. The challenges are so complex that we are required to blur the boundaries of design with those from other fields of knowledge in order to seek solutions. This means that we, we think that uh, the solutions need to be collaborative and we need to expand the, the agency of design and collaborate with other disciplines because no possible change can happen if we don't have an ecosystem, not only of designers, but also of technicians and politicians and other decision makers that want to make these changes. And so we believe we need to shape an alternative future and we can do that by inventing new technologies, prototypes and models of design that can allow us to review the past, the present, but also to better imagine and communicate the possibility of alternative future worlds. This is a call for action because we need a paradigm shift. We see an urgency for a social and environmental equilibrium there's an immense amount of ecosystem degradation and exacerbating social inequalities. For example, in the left here, we see the picture from Chapultepec Park where the presidential house of Mexico was located. Uh, it's also one of the wealthiest areas of Mexico City. And on the right, we see urban sprawl occupying territories that are not suitable for urbanization. And these are in conflicts. So in this context, we think we could embrace these challenges through adaptability strategies, nature-based solution, and green infrastructure integrated to the gray infrastructure that already exists in our cities. Our laboratory, as we had mentioned before, we have mostly worked in Mexico City, but we have also expanded our vision to other countries, to other similar countries in Latin America. This has made us realize that there is no other choice than to experiment. We need to take risk and also we need to evaluate and learn from the experimentation. We need to learn from what works and what is not working 
in order to don't replicate the errors of the past, but also to learn from failure. Our approach, it's a transformative, that transformative projects are processes and not objects. So the design itself, it's not only the design of a, a good drawing, let's say great representations and amazing presentations that we are doing are not enough. We need to ensure that the projects become a successful reality. And we believe this is the real challenge for designers. We need to transcend the paper into a tangible solutions with lasting effects in the world. So how do we do that? Uh, we think that extend, extending the agency of design and creating the processes, designing the process for this change to happen, we believe in territorial advocacy and not just isolated projects. And the process is fundamental for a long-term vision. What we see here, it's the project design. But we envision that there's a larger process and there's a before and an after that happens. So working within academia and government and, and the development banks has taught us that the urban scale can never escape the socio-political dimension. And well, we are here right now. We live in a crisis. We are going through a crisis right now. And well, maybe people can put all again the cameras, but who has experienced, maybe you can shake hands, uh, who has experienced an acu acute crisis before? Maybe not a pandemic, of course, but an earthquake, water scarcity, some kind of crisis. Someone has experienced, I think many people would have experienced crisis before. It's not, it's nothing new, right? Uh, so we think we, we, take, we need to address a crisis, but we need to embrace it. And we, we live, we come from a permanent place of crisis, which is Mexico City. So we live in a context of water scarcity, earthquakes, subsidence, recently extreme violence against women, air pollution, floods, uh, mobility issues, social inequality. So these are very, very challenging uh, subjects. And because of this, this is our context. So we have to say that we have no solutions. What we have is more and more questions every day. So now we are going to present some of our projects. This is just an image from our website. Um, so we, you can see a different types of projects in which we work, which are divided in these categories, research, installations or exhibitions, urban design visions and strategy, landscape projects, and we have also academia, as now I'm teaching here, and Elena and Victor are also professors at UNAM Faculty of Architecture. So within this range of projects, now we are going to start the presentation with the first one, which is um, a project located in Bogota. It's called the Bogota Environmental Circuit. Also, these different uh, projects that I'm going to present are located within research, urban visions, and public space projects. So they, are, uh, they explore different scales and also different types of collaborations because none of these projects have been made by ourselves entirely. We collaborate a lot. So for example, in this project, specifically in Bogota, we collaborated with an office in Bogota called Taller, uh, Manuela Guzman, architects, another friend, Monica Arzos, uh, another friend from Mexico City. And we collaborated directly with the, the Aqueduct of Bogota, which is, which is the Water Authority, and together with the mayor's office. So, the former mayor, Enrique Peñalosa, he envisioned that a good city, it's a city where people wants to be outside and not inside. So he wanted to connect the people to Bogota's natural assets. Bogota is a city very, very rich in biodiversity. We are going to see that in a few slides. And the environmental circuit of Bogota, the project, it's the city's commitment to position itself as a city that plans its territory by integrating urban development with its natural environment. And water, it's the main unifier. 
water it's a unifier for all of this ecosystem and it's what makes possible for these ecosystems to exist. In a glimpse, we present a city vision that integrates a strategic projects for recuperating Bogota's natural capital. It includes reservoirs, a 140 kilometer path across the Andes, several wetlands, and the recuperation of the Bogota River and its tributaries. So it's a strategy that compiled a diverse range of, and, of, and scales of projects. All of them correspond to a systemic vision. So the biodiversity context of Bogota, it's very important. First of all, it's located in the savanna that, that borders the Eastern Andean mountains. So it's a very, very rich country. The second most of the diverse country in the world, and it's the main ecological corridor for South America. Here we see an historic map where you can, you can see the, the wetlands and the Bogota River. You can also see the tributaries and the mountains, all of them in, in relationship. The city itself started by located near the Bogota River, but more and more the city has expanded towards the, the Andes. And we, what we have seen with this urban expansion is that Bogota has lost approximately 90% of the wetlands. So today there are only 700 hectares from the 50,000 hectares that we had before. And this image represents the natural estate of Bogota and then how the urban fabric expanded across this landscape. And we have seen how the city started here in the Rio Bogota and then it went towards a modern city going towards the Andes. And this that we see here, the Andes, it's the most important part for the city. We, this is the, the ecological system that we need to preserve. This is a section and we can see the different range of ecological patches uh, and systems that occur. And the, so this is where Bogota is located. It's at 2,600 uh, meters above the sea level. And where water comes from, it's located at 3,600 and 4,000 meters uh, above the sea level. So it's a region where we could think that there's abundance of water and there is, but yet the urban development is disconnected from the natural world and, the, and its assets. So if the current model of urbanization continues to expand, they are threatening the water sources of Bogota. So the convenience of having clean water coming out of the tap does not make visible the magnitude and the fragility of the water supply infrastructure. 80%, 83% of the water that is consumed in Bogota comes from this, this region. It's called Paramo Chingaza. Paramo is a, a specific type of ecosystem that is located in the altitudes of the mountains. I tried to look for a translation, but I couldn't find one. So for explaining this, this diagram is very helpful because we can see the section. It was developed by a Dutch biologist and paleontologist that studied Bogota. And we, we can see how the territory works by altitudinal stripes. So all of the ecosystem are linked by the passage of water through diff to these different levels until they reach the wetland and river. And in this diagram, we can see the relationship within the mountains that receive the most amount of rain and water and how as water goes down, so this is the high area, water coming down here into the lower area to feed the wetland. So this is the, the ecosystemic vision that we need to know. And when we created this vision and we place the different types of strategic projects, we realized that we need to follow the same logic. So from going from the high areas to the low areas. So we define the, the project in terms of altitude. Also, it's more strategic to start here because the projects here will preserve in the high area near the mountains, will preserve the natural, the natural water sources. So 
we can find the natural paths, we can find uh, across the Andes, we can find the, the reservoir, and also we, we identified other strategic projects in order to improve the quality of life in some of the most marginal neighborhoods, especially in the south, which is here, and towards the west near the river, the Bogota River. And this was a part of the research. We got the city gave us a lot of data and we developed the research. It was divided within environmental aspects, urban aspect, quality of life, and risk of vulnerability. But what we presented to them, it's a map of opportunities. So the, opportunity, the first opportunity is that we can recuperate the, this ecosystem, the darker green uh, are the paramos, the, the, the water sources. Then we have the river, the Bogota River with the wetland and with the river at uh, tributaries. So then we identify other nine strategic zones for interventions where you can find most of the floods of, and the marginal population, population that has not access to urban services, mobility, etc. And then we went into each zone and developed as, uh, also some kind of guidance or strategic projects identifying certain strategies for the nine areas. But I'm not going to show all of the detail, but if you want or someone is interested, this was compiled in a book and we have all of the information and more than what I presented here. And if someone is interested, I can share the link here in the chat and maybe you can go through more detail. Now I'm going to give the word to Victor, who's going to present the research project we have right now. Okay. Um, thanks, Adriana. Um, now we would like to present to you um, our, an ongoing research. Uh, it's called Medium Scale Redevelopment Districts as a Model for Sustainable Water Management in Mexico City. Uh, the case of Tacubaya and we want you to think about the medium scale because it's the key it's a key element of of this whole research um, well first of all the, um, this research is being funded by the Mexico Innovation Fund within the grants program of the David Rockefeller for Latin American Studies um, and we are being guided by Anita Berrisbeitia who is a professor of landscape architecture and chair of the department of, um, yeah, she's the chair of uh, the landscape department at the, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So can we go to the next slide, please, Adri? We are going to copy and paste a couple of links that you guys can have a go at. If you have a, a phone, it's a link to our Instagram um, address. and you will basically be able to see um, the dramatic transformations of Mexico City uh, across 500 years. So it's a city that has had an incredible confrontation with its geography uh, over the past 500 years, but this transformation has been especially violent from the second half of the 20th century. To the present. It's a city that uh, was able to establish itself on top of a lake by way of uh, expelling all, all the water. So basically dehydrating uh, a gigantic, gigantic basin. Um, and so today the water crisis in Mexico City is more than urgent. And the city continues to face enormous pressures to redevelop in a more compact and sustainable way. Uh, the current water management model is no longer sufficient for providing the most basic water services uh, for both existing and new developments. So at the same time, uh, water management policy is becoming increasingly central to the negotiation between uh, new urban developments and water sustainability in the city. This means that um, since there's no more water, it's been very hard for um, entrepreneurs and developers that want to build in central areas of the city 
um, because there's no more water. So now they've been um, forced in a way to be creative in, in the way that they are managing water. So they themselves have approached a different organizations such as WRI, the World Resources Institute, and together with them, we began this uh, exploration of uh, redevelopment districts and the notion of hydric districts as a, as a potential new model for uh, new models of decentralized water management. Um, we wanted to also mention that uh, while architecture has acquired a lot of popularity in an elite world, that has been proportionally inverse to its disempowerment, cultural disenchantment, and inability to deliver design alternatives with the required urgency. So this research questions the role of architects, as Adri mentioned at the very beginning, in light uh, of the most pressing issues of the 21st century. Uh, under the lenses of history, data science, ecology, and geography, this study is reviewing new design tools that can allow us to better understand multi-scalar issues so as to more effectively imagine and communicate new spatial imaginations that can crystallize into alternative forms of transforming Mexico City. Um, it, the research also reflects upon the role of design as an agent to construct um, multi-sectoral participation frameworks, which in other words is the process that Adriana was mentioning earlier, that can guide future water-related public policies and decision-making. But it'll, it, it is also exploring something very interesting, which is the elasticity of the urban and landscape design disciplines at the mid-scale uh, in order to blur the boundaries between the urban and the natural domains, quite similar to the Bogota research. And so in many ways, we are uncovering and resurfacing Mexico City's hydro test. If we go to the next slide. So medium scale development projects present us with an ad adequate scale to address some of the most pressing issues of the regional scale and also allow us to solve the issues that are unique and specific to a more local scale. Uh, it is at the mid, at the mid scale that, architect, that architecture and urban artifacts can function as triggers. Um, so the art architectural artifact can recalibrate its position within the city uh, and a new centrality can be created, as we will mention in, in a while in the case of Tacubaya. So in, this, in a large sense, this idea of the mid-scale is tapping into the, um, the notion of the quasi-object that Michel Serre proposes, which is very interesting to us as a design practice, because um, uh, the quasi-object is still an object and maintains its value as an object, but incorporates new dimensions that enable the participation of other actors. Um, so as opposed to large scale and monofunctional infrastructure and piecemeal green infrastructure, which is how the city is working right now, uh, the medium scale redevelopment district, if we go to the next slide, present us with an adequate scale to address some of the most pressing issues at the regional scale, but also allow us to solve us um, particularities of the more local scale. So the hypothesis is that med medium scale redevelopment districts have a greater potential to deploy multiple water sensitive strategies. So the hope is that the mid scale uh, interventions can more effectively tap into diverse water sources uh, and then explore more decentralized water infrastructures. Um, the hydric district, as we are uh, analyzing, is a highly implementable urban framework that can serve to test alternative physical models of decentralized or urban water management. Um, the project is currently contributing to raise public awareness, inform multi-sectoral participation, and promote the sharing of responsibilities among multiple stakeholders. So, by contrast to conventional large-scale infrastructure and piecemeal small-scale green infrastructure, the hydric districts offer a perhaps more grounded and coordinated framework to address the water crisis in Mexico City. Um, 
we are experiment we are researching Tacubaya for many reasons. Um, historically, Tacubaya has had a strategic location within the geography of Mexico City's water, watershed. Uh, it's privileged location between the slopes of the western ravines, as you can see in the green the greener areas, and the former borders of the ancient lake granted this area with with advantages in terms of security and stability against floods and earthquakes in the past. Uh, also, water abundance and climate made it a perfect site for agricultural activity due, during colonial, the colonial time, and later on, the preferred site for summer estates for rich families, which made it really attractive also for, for other people uh, as there were new sources of employment. Um, but in the end, Tacubaya's history has been marked by repeated cycles that move from attractiveness to settlement, to growth, to scarcity, and then to crisis, and then to the expansion of water infrastructures to, be, to begin the cycle again. Um, you can see here uh, how Tacubaya is right outside the areas where a lot of multiple risks are colliding. Um, and also, Tacubaya's proximity to Mexico City's downtown, which is the white spot in the center, that's, um, that's it. This, is, this would be the size of Mexico City uh, in the early, before the 20th century, 19th century. And Tacubaya is in pink. That's just showing how close they were. Um, so this proximity was key. Um, there were a lot of there was a lot of experimentation in Tacubaya from transport systems to water management to even the exploration of new dwelling models. And that has shaped Tacubaya in a very, very different way, being a historic district uh, from other historic areas in Mexico City like Coyoacán. It has made it very unique, but also it, it has fragmented Tacubaya um, and it has in a way hidden a lot of its, of its history and its natural background. Um, well, also Tacubaya's future development could be guided by an existing land management instrument called SAC. Well, sorry, this is a, an, a historic image of Tacubaya. And we go then to the next, to the next image. All right. So yeah, Tacubaya's future development could be guided by an existing and current land management instrument called Sistema de Actuación por Cooperación, which um, it's not possible to translate, but it's basically a framework that allows, it's a legal framework of land management that allows city authorities and um, development promoters to uh, agree on certain interventions in both the private and the public domain with uh, the public focus. So in, in many ways, it would be a kind of a collaborative governance framework where um, private, um, there are private roles that have public goals, let's say. Um, and recently, Tacubaya was announced as part of the Urban Regeneration and Inclusive Housing Program by the current mayor. Um, but they have presented, unfortunately, a series of isolated projects that could coalesce into a new urban model that can serve to test alternative modes of decentralized water management solutions. So we think that water is the one element that can really articulate all these projects. And Tacubaya, within its mid-scale, can become uh, a pilot project to test alternative models of urbanism, uh, where water is at the very center. So it is, in many, many ways, a collaborative process. Uh, our team is working with authorities and with tech water specialists um, as a bridge between all of them. Um, and we think that this pilot project will help to demonstrate how Mexico City can advance towards a more sustainable, informed and co-responsible water management. These are these the most pressing issues of water stress and also climate change. Um, 
maybe we can show you a, a video of a workshop that was carried out in January. Uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be, yeah, it's inaudible, but uh, we just wanted to show you that we organized this event. Uh, Anita Perezveta came to Mexico City along with four GSD students. We invited UNAM students as well. And there was a very rich uh, discussion among Tacubaya specialists, architects, people from um, the World Resources Institute and politicians as well, discussing uh, what it means for Mexico City to learn from, um, from the mid-scale and the, the Tacubaya case study. And then uh, after this, the, this panel discussion, we organized four, four, um, four groups. Uh, and we asked these four groups to explore uh, three different models of water management. The first one is how to deal with residual water of the new, of the new buildings. 70% um, of, of, the, of the water that, it, that is discharged from new buildings is soapy waters. So instead of, of, of channeling this water to, to the sewage, what if we can make space for this water and reuse it in other uh, spaces, whether it's for irrigation or other purposes? Uh, the second one is rainwater. So all the rainwater that is, that is falling on, on the surfaces of, of the hydric district, uh, what can we do with this water? Can we reutilize it? Can we store it? Can we channel it to uh, other green infrastructure um, or sustain them? Um, yeah, um, green infrastructure. And then finally, runoffs. What can we do with the water that is falling on the streets? Uh, this, these were the questions that were asked in this, in this workshop. And we are going to integrate all the findings of this research or of this workshop from January. It's the projects that have been publicly announced by the, by the city authorities and also by the projects that were identified with, by the World Resources Institute. In um, the compilation of all the projects uh, articulated by water is what we believe can become the, the hydric district. Um, so yeah, this is still an ongoing research, but we will be happy to share with all of you the publication that has to be finished this year. And we think it's a great opportunity to test the abilities or the, the elasticity of the design disciplines within the very, very tight fabric of Mexico City. And I think with this, we can move on to the following project. Hello, is everybody still there? Yeah, I hope so. So the following project, it's called Chinampa Refugee. It's an incremental strategy that it's located in Xochimilco, which is a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Uh, it's where Chinampas, which is an ancestral agricultural technology, is still remain. Protecting wildlife and native species in this area has become increasingly difficult because of the many urban pressures. This is located inside the urban fabric of Mexico City. So we worked in, the, in this project together with the Institute of Biology of UNAM. So it has been great. Uh, a great collaboration be, uh, between science and design. They have been taking measures of water quality, also analyzing the, ha the, the habitats of the species, and we have been grounding uh, on-site strategies for this project to be implemented. Right now, the Chinampia refugee already exists. There are 15 farmers that are taking this pilot project and the vision and this is what that I'm going to show you the vision is to scale it up. So the Chinampe refugee uh, it's a conservation model to rescue the ajolot which is this this little guy that, that you see here and as well as the traditional Chinampa system. This model favors participation, the exchange of knowledge, and permanent construction of a long-term restoration proposal 
where the aim is to integrate the chin emperors or the farmers individually or in an organized manner to be the subject of change and positive impact. So this model, this is a chinampa, this is a picture we taken ourselves last year. This is the, the process, uh, there's a series of the steps that a farmer can deploy. So the process consists on uh, opening a canal. So maybe here it's easier to see it. So the, the chinampas uh, have a have they they have a, the, the farmers have expanded chinampas and they have blocked the original canal. So we open an, a new canal the, to restore the the habitat. Then we also restore the this is a better image. So this is this is a canal. Then we reforestate around the canal so that the soil stabilizes. Then you place bio, bio filters and gates. This helps for the wild, to create a, a new, to improve the water quality inside the canal. And this allows to introduce new species that are able to recreate the habitat in order for the afolotl to exist. Then the farmers need to use uh, organic fertilizer for compost, but they can also use clean water from the channel in order to, to crop. They, they also are based on the traditional farming techniques and they use the traditional crops. So this system is able to maintain and monitor uh, within time. We see here pictures of the, of the little canal. These are the gates, the biofilters, and actually the research show, shows that the water quality inside these canals is better. The ajolotes, uh, have a, a new habitat, farmers are producing more, uh, therefore uh, this is a, a very good model. But this is a very small scale strategy, so we envision how we can replicate this. Some ideas to replicate it is that, and that it's already working. So some ideas are that the farmers receive a chin and pear stamp which is a quality certification that allows a farmer to position itself and be able to sell the products in different markets and restaurants at higher value. And this also allows to the farmer to have financial sustainability so that they can continue developing the system. And this avoids the chinampa to be transferred into an urban area or to, to avoid the increasing rate of greenhouses that this area is looking at. So at the end of the day, uh, we envision a, that the system can, create, can be replicated in, within the short, medium, and long term to be replicated across the area and reactivate Xochimilco as our production hub. So uh, besides having this uh, small, uh, small scale prototype, then we also help the Institute of Biology to specialize the chinampas that can grow in the medium and long term and the area. So we can start to create some chinampa clusters that are already recuperated and then and therefore this, this can provide a new vision. And this is the last project because I see that we are already going to the end of the presentation but we wanted to share also this project uh, is one of the latest one that we have developed. It's called Garden of Shadows, and it's a landscape infrastructure for cities in the northern desert of Mexico. This is a competition that was organized by CEDATU, which is the Ministry of Agriculture, Territory, and Urban Development in Mexico. They organized this competition to bear with UNAM. This project is for the urban improvement program that the federal government is now running. So the aim of the project and of the program itself is to work on the 10 of the most marginalized cities in Mexico. And they located 10 cities that are the most vulnerable populations and these areas are going to receive an investment in infrastructure, which can be from streets, parks, schools, hospitals, etc. So 
the, the Ministry of Development uh, allocated this competition and they made a call for uh, architects and designers. We were uh, selected to participate on the public space um, area of the, of the project. And at the beginning, we were assigned the site and the city, but they actually said that they didn't know where actually the project was going to be, but that it was, we knew the cities and the cities were located in the northern part of Mexico, actually very close to the border within Mexico and the US. And our strategy was like to think what is that unified the city, what brings them together and what brings them together is climate. All of them are located, mostly, most all of them are located in the desert. The, their temperatures ranges from uh, 98 to 100 or 104 Fahrenheit, which is a very, very hot climate. So what, how can a public space work in a hot climate and how can people really use this space? Uh, we think that the concept of shadow was, was very important. So we begin, these are the two, the two boards that we submitted for the competition. And the good news is that we won. So we are very happy, no? Because we had the, the idea, that this is it. This is the part when you, we start to realize the, how to ground ideas and take the ideas uh, from the mind to the paper and then into the real world. So at this stage, uh, our project had three pillars, which is to create a microclimate through, this is to create shadow through vegetation and also to different infrastructure so that as, as this building that we see here, or this structure is actually uh, a structure, then how can we can integrate this into the most vulnerable areas so that this provides uh, quality space for these people and also its resilience because we analyze the city, which is Los Cabos. It's a city that receives the most amount of hurricanes every year in Mexico. So when we look at, at our plan, we saw that the city has floods, but they also have high winds and hurricanes. And that the, this area, which is the one that I'm pointing out, the, the shelters were not, were not in place. So we believe that the public space can be adapted to a shelter, and that's what we propose, so that this structure can be also converted in a shelter in terms of emergency. There could be a cistern in place. It could ensure access to water, to electricity. We propose also to have Wi-Fi in order to ensure communications. And then it was a series, it was this, this structure uh, together with a series of plazas. And of course, endemic vegetation that will be suitable for the place. And this is an image of, the, of, of that site and the competition site. But then uh, in, when, we, when we won, there were several discussions and the site change, but luckily not the city that allows to uh, continue using the information we have developed before. And the, this is where the previous site was. And now the, the site that actually, uh, the, the site that we designed is this one. The site was very complex because was located besides a, an old landfill. So actually, uh, the city wanted to, to develop a park in the landfill, but that was a very uh, complex project because first you have to remediate the land and there were no all resources that were available that we told that were available for the park will go into the site remediation. So after doing some studies on, on the quality of the soil, this space actually <laughs> that looks as a, um, vacant space, um, most as a, mostly as a leftover of a space. It's the one that we, we end up utilizing. This is a space where if you see here uh, in the map, you can see that there's a stream going, but this is not a permanent stream. It's a stream that only appears every time it's flooded. So the, this side will, the downstream will get flooded. And it's also very insecure area, but people use it as a path for, to go from this low area to this higher point. And this is uh, the proposal. 
uh, we had the the we we were luckily we, we could remain the the shelter with a multi sports court uh, below and an auditorium uh, we also have here uh, a sports area and then all the landscape infrastructure this is a diagram um, the water authority of the city wanted to build a canal here so uh, our project is located besides this canal and uh, we are using the, the idea we created these some terraces so that they can we, we manage to let them filter some water from the canal to the terraces so we can have different activities and these are some of the renderings that we have we are using a stone for the place actually this stone was located uh, in the other side of the landfill and we are placing them in order to create this series of steps we have here the, the structure with the auditorium and this is other images and now we have the actually it's getting construct very very fast we have received we receive these images when once in a while as this is rapidly under construction they started at the end of last year and this is the most uh, the old the, the newest pictures that we, we have from the site so we are very happy that some of the ideas from the competition are actually being realized others we, we couldn't but but at the end we, we are looking forward to see the the results of this and this is the end of the presentation i want to thank you everybody for being here and being patient and listen to us and i believe that now we have an opportunity to to open up for questions and to have a conversation Yes, thank you so much, Adriana. Victor, I think like uh, Laila had mentioned at the very beginning, we would like the student to type their questions in the chat feature, and then we will read it for you guys. Great, thank you. Okay, I think I received the first question uh, from, and I apologize for mispronouncing any name, uh, from Adiel. She's asking if you can please explain the, comp the competition process. I'm not sure which competition she's mentioning here. Is it I maybe the last project? That probably the last competition, yeah. Yeah. Um, this this one at the beginning the competition process it was organized by the government by the federal government and they had different categories so they have public infrastructure where you had markets hospitals schools they have another category for public space and landscape that's where we were invited and the competition was organized together with the Faculty of Architecture at UNAM, which is the National University of Mexico. They coordinated the competition and they also invited the architects and firms to, to participate. Um, so we, we were invited and it was a very fast uh, competition because we received the invitation and more or less two weeks later we had to deliver an idea so everything has been happening really fast in this project almost we haven't realized what what happened great thank you I have another question from Nika Tepper in your project working with an UNESCO site are there specific protocols you must follow in terms of historic cultural preservation uh, well, actually, the project was tackling the historic preservation uh, 
mythology because what is protected is the agricultural technique, the chinampa itself. It's an ancient technique that was developed by the Aztecs. So these were floating islands. So this area is in danger because urbanization is threatening the, the model. So by recuperating the, the chinampas, uh, we are working hand in hand with preservation. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question from Candelaria. Do you see the mid-scale Takubaya strategy being applied and implemented, adapted for other regions? How could this vision work for Arab cities? Yeah, um, we think it's a highly implementable model, uh, not just because it's technically feasible, but also because there's no more water. So uh, developers are now, as we mentioned in the presentation, um, forced in a way to be creative and they are actually very open to, to study and to understand what, what new techniques and what they have to offer to the city in order to implement uh, circular models of water management. So technically it's, 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 it's possible. And there are, well, now Tacubaya is, it is an interesting case because there's the interest of uh, both the developers and also the city has announced it as a strategic area. So it's a great opportunity, but uh, I think the case of Tacubaya can be presented to other city authorities and let them know that there's no need to wait for water to be completely scarce. And why wait for that moment? Let's try uh, this model in, in, other, in other, you know, in places that are not yet with this level of stress. Um, but in the end, well, the, the ways that we can manage water are very similar here in Tacubaya and in other parts, in other cities. So we think it's, it's very, very feasible. Thank you. The next question is from Jamie Anaya. What has been the most challenging aspect for ORU in implementing long-term sustainable ur urban design approaches in a country like Mexico, which tends to work around short-term formal results? So how do you sustain kind of a long-term approach in a case where short-term is the way to go, let's say? Yeah. So, I mean, so far, our practice, is, our practice is very young. We, we exist only, uh, for, we, have, we only have two years of, of existence, but we have uh, worked um, previously with uh, city authorities and in the Latin American case and, or in the case of Mexico, um, the biggest challenge is to, um, skip, let's say, the interests that different parties have on, on a particular spot or a particular area. In, in many ways, even though you have a, a great vision and even though you have all the technical solutions, there will be always um, interests that, that are colliding with, with, with these the proposals, right? So to us, I think this is the, this is the hardest part to, to make sure that everybody understands um, the purpose of the project and the, and the, and the uh, best available, available solutions. But unfortunately, sometimes we just get on the way of, of, these, of these visions. Um, but I think the other, the other, the other, um, the other challenge is just to be open uh, to collaborate with financial special. We're not used to collaborate with financial specialists. We're not used to sitting on the table uh, on a table with um, uh, with other disciplines that are uh, that are looking onto onto uh, maintenance mechanisms. So it's just a question of uh, being able to to create the framework in, in which. Um, other people can also uh, contribute to, to the to the to the lasting vision of, of the project. 
is there maybe as a follow-up is there kind of financial model that they would have to follow that you put in motion let's say in order to make sure some of those long phased element uh, are uh, still built or achieved well i think each project has its own particularities and i think each each project or each case needs to be reviewed uh, one by one but it's um a, both operation maintenance and finance solutions are are uh, necessary strategies and uh it's it's just something that is not on at the very top of our minds when when des while designing something you know, we a lot of a lot of the times we think that the design will stand for itself but but that's not necessarily true and uh, we need to be able to spend time working out with financial specialists and with people that are able to activate the, the project because we can we can't do it all this is this is something important we we can't we don't have the control of of the, of the project especially at these scales Thank you. Uh, Anushai Eliradi, I think, uh, uh, question is, um, this question pertains to sustainability and maintenance. For example, the agricultural project, second to last, how do you assure the infrastructure ma is maintained? Are the farmers trained, for example, do you need to design their training into the phasing of the project? Yeah, that was part of the project, um, as this allows the farmer to have a financial sustainability. Because the problem is that right now, the farmers, they have the land, but even if, 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 if they produce, they will not sell, they, they have no access to the market to sell their products. And if they want to compete with the industrial agriculture, they, they can do so. They, they can compete with the large industrial producers, right? So, this this is why the the um, label uh, the certificate that is given to them allows them to sell their products as a fair rate as a, they have high revenues and this is an incentive for them to continue developing the system so this is this is included into into the design this is the, the last part thank you uh matt Brubacher asks, working with large public entity, i.e. the government, has limitation, but also offers a certain amount of motive power, funding, structure, etc. Can you imagine a way that we as architect could start to bring this vision, process, or benefits to a more community, grassroots, or small-scale group working semi-privately with limited resources? So how can you bring the government into um, kind of the smaller scale grassroots approach? Yeah. I think that the process that we mentioned, uh, we want to tackle that so that we can connect the community needs with the opportunity uh, that the, the government has to invest in, in some areas. But sometimes the communities, they don't have a voice. So for us, it has been really important to connect with them and learn from what they need and then bring that into the design. And then by integrating them into the conversation, I think it's, we don't create proposals that come from our mind and imagination, rather we like to integrate different voices. So actually in, in the Tacubaya project, for example, right now we have found an amazing partner, which is called Graciela. And she's a, a lady that lives in Tacubaya and she's actually super connected. She knows everybody and she has allowed us, she even shared more information than what we were able to find. Uh, she had all the government plans that the city has developed throughout many years. Uh, she knows all the, all the problems and she has told us, we even had the, right now that we are going through this crisis, we even had the other day a meeting with her by Zoom and she told us like we, we were discussing our proposal with her. So I think we have to reimagine how can we can find these key players into the communities. Right, and I just want to add something, something else that in, I'm sure this happens in other parts of the world, but here communities are very powerful. Communities can both promote a project or can stop big projects. 
So I, I think our, our role as designers is to connect, as, as we already mentioned and as Adriana uh, illustrated, is to be able to bridge the needs of, of everyone, basically, into a, a, um, a strategy that is catering to everybody's interests in a way. But this is, of course, this is, this is one of the hardest parts in, in, in the design discipline. So if I ask Victor, actually, and through what channels or in what venues would you say the community is able to express itself? Uh, as you mentioned, they have the power to do so. Yeah. So one, one thing that we, that we did is, for example, the, the video that we showed you in, in Tacubaya. This was, a, uh, this was an event where we invited everyone. Uh, the neighbors of Tacubaya, water specialists, politicians, uh, professors, uh, and it was a, since it's a neutral ground, everybody has a voice and everybody is able to express their uh, preoccupations and what they think is good for, for the area. And it's just a, 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 um, a space, it's just being able to open these spaces so that, so as to, um, so that everyone can be heard. And, and then this of course has consequences, right? So a, this is just one, one, one example of how you can do it, but, but it's something that, that we need to make sure that that is carried out through the whole process. Uh, we need to make sure that, that everyone is taken into account in every step, in, in every step of the process. Thank you. Um, one more question that I have from Antonia Abel. Uh, you, uh, she says, you mentioned the relationship between the Garden of Shadows and the channel next to it. Was that the main influence in your choice of vegetation for the project? And what else did you take into account? Um, so the choice of vegetation uh, has to do with, with the site and with the species that are endemic to the desert and to this tropical desert climate that is located in the city. And I think the question was also about the, the water channel, which uh, was built by the water authority. And since the channel was located besides our project, uh, we tried to integrate it to these platforms uh, where you can span the floodplain so that water is not only channelized, but if the water is flowing, you, we can use here and maybe the water will create a, a garden. Yeah, so just to complement that, uh, the canal was built just to make sure that the water that is flowing in, the, in, this, in this area is channeled into a series of infiltration gardens. Um, so rather than water just flowing through the space and then ending up accumulating in the lower areas, we are using the, the infiltration gardens to keep the water in, in this spot as much as as much as possible yeah it was a way of hacking the create massive infrastructure that they wanted to implement um, we couldn't get rid of it it was a fight that we didn't we couldn't but uh, we're starting to find grounds of how to hack these infrastructures so this infrastructure was kind of imposed on you do you say more than in collaboration I guess in terms of that edge. Um, well, yeah, I would say uh, uh, the water authority had it, its own project, and yeah. they had to align. So we we had to make a, a way into <coughs> that we can integrate both uh, both desires. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I don't see any other questions, but maybe I have one follow up question based on some of the thoughts that were brought up. You had mentioned at many points, I think in your presentation, a few operating words that I thought were very interesting, like you, the mid-scale, for example, you came back to it over and over. You described something called as the quasi-object, which I think is very interesting. You also talked about the incremental strategy and how to replicate that. And all of those kind of strategies are a pushback against, let's say, the top-down approach that the government usually is driven towards, or also a pushback against the more say bottom-up piecemeal approach that one would see happening 
but not having the incremental scale that you desire. So I, I suspect that the mid scale is not really a uh, proportional. It doesn't have, let's say, specific dimensional criteria for you. It has some other criteria right. with which you define what it is, whether it was a social or ecological or, uh, or other. So I would like to hear maybe from you more about how do you define that mid operating mid scale that you are interested in? Right. So, yeah, uh, exactly. The mid scale has, doesn't necessarily have a, a, a fixed uh, dimension. In the case of Tacubaya, it's uh, is something that we are still defining. Um, the in, the land management instrument that we mentioned for Tacubaya has is is basically a polygon, is a defined polygon. But in our research, we are discovering that in, interventions at that scale are not necessarily need to be confined within the limits of that polygon. But um, it's kind of a mix between. Uh, neighborhood limits, also large scale infrastructure such as urban highways, uh, the path of runoffs that used to be rivers in the past. So it's, uh, um, it's basically an overlaying different uh, kinds of information. So as to have an idea of, of what the area of, of, the, mid, of the mid scale in this, in this case would be. Um, but yeah, the, the, the idea of the, of the quasi object is, is very near to the idea of the process where you can actually incorporate, um, new dimensions that enable multiple participations. Um, and then you have, uh, maybe architectural interventions that trigger the, you know, the, the, the process of, um, or the construction of, of the new, let's say, the new model of the city. Um, this was interesting to us because we know that uh, if we are thinking of Mexico City in terms of water sensitivity, one cannot deploy uh, strategies at the scale of Mexico City. That's impossible. But, but the mid-scale, we think, offers a more grounded opportunity to test multiple solutions and engaging with multiple partners. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a new concept even to us and we are also very interested in exploring the solutions that the landscape disciplines have to offer within the very, very tight urban fabric. Uh, a lot of, of, of landscape uh, projects that we have seen occur in, in, in open areas or in, in, in areas that are really outside these uh, the, the tight fabric of the city. So to us, it was interesting to, to see and, and to explore the, uh, the limits of the landscape uh, disciplines in, in this kind of urban fabrics. Yeah, maybe to complement that, we, we are also looking at the mid scale because we have, uh, but water has no, I'm, I'm putting here an image of uh, Water has no different boundaries. Usually we have the boundary, the political boundaries, the municipal boundaries, the roads, but water does not ref reflect that. So uh, we had a, done an analysis of the different scales of the watersheds in Mexico City. And what we found is actually that even if the, the area where the this polygon where the government was, went to work, it's, it's kind of here, it actually corresponds to this micro watershed because it's still immense, which goes from the hills with this stream that will flow into, into this area. So it's also the understanding of the territory of in which we are trying to develop the approach of the, we call it the, the mid scale, right? But it's also a concept of how the large, the different scales are related to each other. Yeah, thank you. No, that was great. I think it's really interesting to kind of think about it, especially in the way you elaborated now, like the quasi object, object, it doesn't imply a full object, but it's not the field or it's not the landscape only. It's, uh, it's not only architecture, it's not only landscape. I guess it sits between these Correct. discipline, the way we understand them as separate. Uh, so it kind of intersect both. And I like this kind of the way you describe it, that there's 
it's not, it's, there's a lack of boundaries, especially when you think about water very clearly, but you're also talking about social boundaries, lack of social boundaries and economic boundaries, et cetera, because a site doesn't tend to be so autonomous, right, as we operate on it. And um, which I think is a really kind of exciting way to think about form, let's say form making yeah. and intervent intervention, physical intervention that doesn't lend itself either in architecture or in landscape, uh, yes. so to speak. And also it doesn't talk about one entity, right? So you talk about multiple partners coming together. So it's, I think it's almost like you're locating yourself in between all of those with a kind of quasi position. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Is it, yes, that's correct. We, uh, this is why we've been very insistent in the, in the notion of, of blurring boundaries. And yeah. I think the, 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 the quasi object is that is precisely that it's the blurring of the boundaries between many, many elements from political, social, water, uh, urban, landscape. It's been an interesting and exciting research yeah. for us. This no, that's idea. great. And I'm glad you expand on it because I don't want also to get the impression that from the students working on their project, I'm thinking from their studio point of view now, that you're not talking about moving from the lot to the block, right, to the urban. You're talking about another form of defining yeah. a site or a transect or a site of for intervention. That doesn't belong yeah. to the way we kind of use to uh, think about scales, let's say. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think that's great. Thank you so much. I mean, if you, unless you have more things to share with us, uh, I think it's been like a really good an hour and a half now, an hour 20 minutes yeah. with very interesting questions. So I would like to, again, thank you for making yourself available from two different locations. Uh, yeah, thank you. And it's been really fun and great uh, kind of I don't want to say it's a distraction from where we are <laughs> today. It's actually yeah. it's very much engaged with it, but it's also kind of it opens the imagination to think for the future. No, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So thank you everybody um, also for being here. Yes, Victor, please. Yeah, no, just, for, just to finish, um, if anybody wants, we can share with you several links of the, of the work and the research that we're carrying out. And perhaps just one final message for uh, all the students is that uh, well, just transformative projects are actually the result of a collective effort and that requires links between advocates, designers, policymakers, uh, communities and politicians. So uh, don't be afraid to go out there and engage all these parties.